This is the third lecture for the course PH203, Critical Thinking of Mid-South Christian College. As mentioned in the course syllabus, one of the learning objectives of this course is to enable students to apply critical thinking skills to their academic career and to their own personal development. One of the key elements of applying critical thinking to your personal life and to your career is the ability to solve problems. In this lecture, we will look at one method for solving problems, which is called action research. Action research is the process of posing a question, a doubt, issue, dilemma, problem, or challenge, gathering data about the question, reflecting on that data, and making decisions about your next course of action. This is not the same as doing a research paper. It's not about extracting information about a certain topic from an encyclopedia. It's about gathering data and making an educated guess about what your next step should be, taking action, and then reflecting back on what you learned through that experience. It is the investigation of the effects of certain actions that move us toward new actions. It is a series of spiral steps, each of which constitutes a cycle of planning, action, and searching for data about the results of that action. It is looking for solutions for the purpose of learning. In the context of organizations, action research is the search for knowledge while simultaneously attempting to improve the quality and productivity of the organization. Typically, it is designed by the same people who are analyzing the data to improve their own performance. Action research is a spiral process, meaning that you repeat the process over and over until you find a solution that satisfies. You start out with a problem. Then you design a possible strategy for dealing with the problem. Or at a minimum, you decide what your next step will be in tackling the problem. Then you take action. This is the core of this approach. After you have taken action, then you reflect back on what happened. Usually in the first cycle of the problem, it's not completely resolved. In fact, quite often, new complications arise. The final step is to capture your learning. If you don't record what you learned, you will forget it and have to reinvent the wheel again and again. Next, you repeat the cycle of problem design, action, reflection, and capturing your learning. You do this as many times as it takes to solve the problem. So the first thing you need is a good problem. Not all problems are appropriate for this approach to problem solving. Some problems are too easy to solve. For example, problems with only one cause that is easily identifiable is not a good problem for action research. If it's a problem that fits neatly into your current mental model, then it's probably not a good one for action research. Social scientists refer to a certain kind of problem as a wicked problem because they are so difficult to solve. What are the characteristics of a wicked problem? Well, they are important. These are problems that truly need a solution. They are complex, meaning that they consist of many interdependent parts. They have multiple causes. Too often we fail to resolve such problems because we assume there's a straight line between one cause and the negative effect, when in fact there may be many causes that are separated by time and space. A wicked problem is also a recurring problem. They seem to crop up in a cyclical manner. These kinds of problems also demand action. Something needs to be done. You can't just leave it alone and hope it goes away. This kind of problem also resists structure. You have structure when you can see how all the parts are linked together. But with these problems, you just can't see how it all fits. Quite often, these kinds of problems lead to very surprising solutions. The second step is to design a plan. It doesn't have to be an elaborate plan, but should contain the elements discussed in the previous lecture. An overall goal, two or more objectives, and action steps for each objective. If it's a particularly pernicious problem, then you've probably already tried common solutions. So now it may be time to reframe the problem. Our textbook talks about framing language. These are words, phrases, metaphors, symbols, definitions, grammatical structures, questions, and so on, which we use to think and speak of things in a certain way. By taking your problem and reframing it with new words and phrases and symbols, you may be able to have new insight into the problem. It might also help to look at the problem from different contexts. Try placing your problem into several different situations to see what it looks like from that point of view. For example, what does it look like from within the context of your job or career? What does it look like from within the church? What about the family? What might the problem look like from within a third world country? Problems can also take on new meaning when looking at them from different perspectives. Let's take racism, for example. This topic looks very different from the perspective of a middle-class white family that has never experienced racial discrimination 
than from the perspective of an 80-year-old black male who, when he was 20 years old, actually witnessed the bludgeoning and hosings that the black peace protesters experienced during the height of the civil rights movement. It also helps to look at the problem as part of a larger system. Richard Daff defines a system as a set of interacting elements that acquires inputs from the environment, transforms them, and discharges outputs to the external environment. In other words, a wicked problem is part of a larger combination of interacting parts. What are the forces coming from outside the context that may be feeding the problem? What are the effects of the problem on the larger system? It may also help to compare your problem to a similar problem, but within a completely different field or context. What would this problem look like to an engineer, to a school teacher, to a farmer, or to a migrant worker? Finally, we need to look at the problem from the perspective of different groups. In a business context, you might ask, what does this problem look like from the perspective of management, from the perspective of the customer, from the perspective of the supplier, from the perspective of the community? The third step is to take action. Plans without action are worthless. In fact, action is the very heart of action research. It's very different from what most students think of when they think of writing a research paper. That's all about hitting the books. This is about taking action and studying the effects of that action. There are three things you want to make sure you do during the action phase. First, control the progress. By that I mean keep track of progress. Are you seeing improvements or are things getting worse? Second, collect data. If your problem involves a health issue, you may want to track things like mood level, blood pressure, heart rate, and things like that. Third, create periodic reports, even if it means reporting to yourself. Okay, so the fourth step is to reflect on the action taken. Let's talk about what that means. One author states that action research is a cycle of action and reflection, and that this interplay between these two activities is at the heart of action research. So it is the continual interaction between these two activities that forces the solution to come to the surface. Michael Baer and Russell Eisenstadt define reflection as a process of entering into dialogue based on the data collected and guided by a systemic framework to discover the root causes of the problem. In a sense, reflection is simply taking time to think, which is what critical thinking is all about. Remember, reflection comes after you have taken some kind of action. You are reflecting on the results of that action. Here are some questions that might help you. What did I expect to happen? What did you think would happen as a result of the action? What actually happened? Seldom is an outcome exactly what we envisioned. You may even find that the problem got worse rather than better. Why did this happen? Try to identify the forces that influenced the outcome. What will I do next? In view of what happened, what is the next step you will take? Finally, you need to capture the learning. This is a critical step in the process, without which the process is incomplete. Failing to capture the learning is the reason why many problems continually reappear. In organizations, people often don't make information available to the rest of the organization, and this knowledge ends up lost when certain individuals leave or when the team disbands. To avoid this, the information must be captured and institutionalized, a process that includes a range of activities to normalize, codify, and store the knowledge. To sum up, action research seeks to accomplish two things. Of course, the first goal is to solve the problem, but if you only focus on solving the problem, then the learning part may be lost. So it's important to remember that action research is also about learning. This concludes the third lecture for the course PH203, Critical Thinking of Mid-South Christian College. Thank you for watching.